Well, welcome everyone. I want to thank you for being here in this virtual space. I know many of you are watching this later as a video in the future, so welcome to you as well. I'm Kimberly and I'm here at the Country Bookshop, which is a bookstore in Southern Pines, North Carolina. We are a few years away from our 70th anniversary and we are here to help you out with anything you need book-wise, so please reach out to us. If you cannot get to Southern Pines yourself, I'll put into the chat, uh, we recently did a tour of the store for uh, Jenna Bush's Read with Jenna um, video. So I'll give that to y'all so you can see what, who we are. Um, I will introduce our moderator who will be in conversation with James Patterson and Matt Eversman and turn it over. Thank you again for being a part of this great virtual event. Before Dan Schilling was an author, he spent more than 30 years in the military, primarily as a combat controller and special tactics officer. During the battle that many know as Black Hawk Down, he survived the initial assault and carnage only to return to the city to rescue his two closest friends, becoming literally last out. He later founded and then served as the first commander of two special operations squadron, one of which's name and purpose remains classified to this day. His final military assignment was the Joint Special Operations Command Weapons of Mass Destruction U.S. Interagency and Intelligence Community Director. His military certifications include HALO and Stadkline Master Parachutist, Special Forces Combat Diver and Demolitions Instructor. He and his wife, Julie, live in the mountains of Utah, and he can often be found skiing or flying his speedwing near, near Alta Ski Resort, or whenever I try to call Dan to try to rope him into doing things like this, he's always helping uh, disabled people go down mountains and ski. Pretty incredible. Uh, Dan's forthcoming book, The Power of Awareness, can be purchased through the Country Bookshop. I'll post a link in the chat, and it is a great book where Dan applies his training to our everyday non-military situations about how we can use the tools of the professionals to be more situationally aware and use intelligence to avoid bad situations in day-to-day -day life. I met Dan as he was touring for his book, Alone at Dawn which has been one of the Country Bookshop's top selling books for two years in a row. Thank you. Alone at Dawn is a behind the scenes look at the Air Force Combat Controllers, the world's deadliest and most versatile special operations force, whose members must not only exceed the qualifications of Navy SEAL and Army Delta Force teams, but also act with sharp decisiveness and deft precision, even in the face of life-threatening danger. The book tells this story specifically through John Chapman, a SEAL left for dead, then engaging in two dozen Chechnya and Uzbekistan fighters while mortally wounded to save the lives of his teammates and a rescue squad. He was the first airman in nearly 50 years to receive the Medal of Honor. Dan's first book was one he edited with one of our guests, and I will let Matt and Dan continue telling you about that as part of their conversation with James Patterson to talk about Walk in, our co in My Combat Boots. Thank you so much for being here. And if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and I will make sure that they get to Dan. Thank you very much. Well, Kimberly, thanks so much for that very gracious introduction. And of course, uh, and to the entire uh, Country Bookshop for hosting this event and these two prestigious gentlemen, uh, I have to say that the Country Bookshop is one of my favorite indies because it serves one of the greatest communities in America, and that is the Special Operations and Infantry Forces and other folks that populate Fort Bragg, North Carolina. So it's really an honor to be here. But uh, I'd like to, to move on to our, our two guests. First of all, James Patterson, sir, it's an absolute privilege to be able to uh, introduce you and facilitate your discussion for that, what I think is a very important book. And always Matt Eversman, who is a, a, a combat veteran buddy of mine of many years uh, now ago, it's always, always an honor to see you, my friend. So with that, I think maybe what I'd like to ask you two gentlemen 
it's it's so fascinating to see you two here together. One of you is this incredible, you know, lifelong passion for writing, and the other is a, a committed life and profession. Basically of, illiterate. Uh, I know it's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? It's crazy. <laughs> and someone had to help him, James. Someone had to help Matt get to that point and complete a you know a full sentence grammatically. Um, but you know, how did you two come together in the first place? What brought? I'll tell you our mission, and then and then Matt can can sort of in terms of why we got together, how we got together. When we when we sat down to to ultimately start the book, and 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 now uh, the, the mission was twofold. One, if you had been if you've been in the military, uh, or if you've been in combat, that you would read this book and go. Sergeant Eversman and Patterson got it right. And they've given us a voice because this isn't from a general's point of view. This is from the grunts. These are the people on the ground. These are the people that do the work. And, and so that's the one piece of it. The second piece is if you're one of those people who doesn't really understand the military, and this is probably the most important thing. And this is why, you know, we've sent it to uh, the first lady. We've sent it to the new head of veterans affairs, et cetera. And we'll send it to the Congress. People don't understand the military. And I think Dan, you and Matt know that. Um, and if you read this book, I think you will, for the first time in your life, understand what it means to serve and understand, this is a hard one to grasp, but understand what it means to put your life on the line for someone else. And if you read the book and, and then you, you thank a, a military person for their service, you will you will actually understand what you're thanking them for. So that was our that's our mission. In terms of how we came together, it started in a bar, right, Matt? It, it did. Like all good stories, it always starts in a bar, and there we were. Um, but we have a, a mutual friend, uh, Jim and I. His name's Tim Malloy, and uh, Tim had been a, a career journalist, and uh, I met when we uh, when we first moved down here to West Palm Beach. And a long story, not so short. Well, oh, short story, not long. Whichever one that I'm trying to say. Tim uh, invited me to go to Afghanistan with him in 2018 to do a show about our advances in battlefield medicine, uh, mm -hmm. which is pretty intriguing. I, you know, I'm not, you know, what do I know about battlefield medicine other than the obvious point of point of injury kind of trauma stuff? But this was fantastic. Anyway, prior to going, Tim said, "Hey, I think um, it'd be good to go have a drink with Jim Patterson and, you know, maybe get some guidance from him about." you know, how we should be looking to tell a story. And of course- And Jim will probably pay for the drinks. And we can only hope, <laughs> but you know, it's one of those, like, it's surreal. Like what, what are the odds that you're gonna have an opportunity to sit down with, you know, arguably the greatest storyteller of all time. And so we did. Um, and from there, Jim gave us some really good guidance and some good things to think about. And, uh, you know, Eight months later, I get a call out of the blue from uh, from Jim, and he says, "Hey, Matt, this is what I'm thinking." And you know, listen, I've had a lot of bad PLFs, and uh, you know, those those, those feet ass head kind of landings. But when he says you want to do something, you know, you nod your head north south and yeah. say, "Yes, sir, you're yes, sir." You're obligated. Obviously, you, you do. So that really was it. It was uh, it was happenstance. Well, what happened not was, I mean, crazy. I watched the the, the film that that. Uh, uh, Matt and Tim had put together and Matt did a lot of the interviews and I you know when you watch 60 minutes or whatever and I've been on there you, you there's a sort of a screen between the interviewer and the the because the, they don't you don't entirely trust the person this interview like I don't trust you at all Dan I don't know you <laughs> and so the questions no but so there's not that openness that you want but when Matt was interviewing uh, uh, these military personnel there was no screen they were comfortable. He knew the right, right questions to ask, and he knew the right follow-up questions to ask. And you know, when I when I was growing up, uh, my father came back from World War II. He would never talk about it, and that's the experience of a lot of us, where our mothers and uh, husbands, fathers, sons, daughters, whatever, who come back and they don't really want to talk to civilians about it. And uh, it, it, I I thought that Matt would get stories out of people that that maybe they hadn't told to other people, certainly to civilians. And, and that's what happened. And then what separates this book is um, we went from these 40 or 50 page interviews down to these five, six, seven page stories in right. which I think 
And, and I've never done a book, no Alex Cross, no Women's Murder Club, where I've had such positive response from readers. I mean, it's just, it's mind boggling to both of us, the responses we're getting, because it's truth. It's just, it's the reality. It puts you there and you understand every one of these stories. You, you, you will remember the person, you remember things about them, and, and you remember their story. So, I mean, that's kind of at least the beginning of, of what happened. So did... Uh, in this in this encounter in the bar, did you guys end up on the floor at the end of the evening, or did you actually walk out upright <laughs> under your own steam? Yeah, we, we walked out. We walked out. Okay, all right. I, I don't want to bog down on that. I, I just know, trying to you know, one make of those, sure I see whatever the, the cars are that drive you home. You know. Whatever. Okay, that's good. Advice of counsel. Like, <laughs> well, so uh, you know, I found it interesting with the book how you categorize things, and and, and James, this might be back to what you were talking about too, but it's the whole entry into the military and why people came in and then training, which is a really critical component that is so often overlooked in books, unless it's a, you know, autobiographical sort of, you know, tome, but otherwise we don't really concentrate on that. And I, I thought that coupled with what it's like to be downrange, come home, and then that Memorial Day finish, which is what matters to so many Americans. How did you land on that construct? Uh, well, it had to do with the way the way the interviews were run because they go ahead, Matt. Yeah, no, Jim. Let me. Uh, I, I would just tell you, Dan. There was not a, a, a pronounced idea like let, let's look for five different you know phases of of like this 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 arc, you know, so to right. speak. And it just really started with with getting the the conversations going, and you know, as you know, the people one time are talking about what what was so impactful to them was why they joined and it would just sort of naturally group itself and listen I, I would just do a, a 92 hour interview with them transcribe it print it out you know and take you know a couple hundred pages over to Jim to you know to, for him to look at after I looked at it and I think you know if I wouldn't speak for it it's probably the lateral to, to Jim it it probably just jumped out I, I would think, you know, the way well, it came, I think before well, and the structure that. was in the interviews because we went from why did you get in through basic through what happened, you know, uh, uh, in, in the field and then right. what's happened since whether some of them are out, some of them are still in service. So we had all that. And uh, in terms of, of, of the stories that we told for individuals, it depended on what we thought was the most interesting, the most fascinating in some cases why they get in was was really important. In some cases, it was those couple of stories that they told us. I mean, like one of the stories, uh, it was a reservist and he was a dentist. And uh, Saddam Hussein, when he was captured, had some some problems with his teeth. So he was brought in to deal, you know, to, to be Saddam Hussein's dentist. And, and Hussein told him, he said, look, I just made up the weapons of mass destruction because I knew it would mess with the Americans' heads, you know. So, so that became obviously a focus of, of, of that man's story. But that's the way it was. And then and in some cases, the, the, the bigger part of the story was what happened to them after they got out. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and to pause real quick, I just wanted to let you two guys know that uh, Mike Levasseur, I hope I didn't butcher your name, is he has, has joined us. So he's already, you know, he's the first story in the book. Just yeah. wanted to let you guys know um, but, you know, back to the methodology, I think, uh, Jim, between you, um, both of you guys, Matt, is that the condensation of that and the editing process that makes so many stories in a row run back and forth without the depth. But what it gives you is a really, it's almost an overwhelming impression of this is the experience for so many people. And I think by bringing it down to such a narrow, you know, page bandwidth, if you would, I think helps move what you're trying to do along. You know, I was actually taken by the very last story, who I think, if I'm correct, you, you dedicated the book to. And it's, yeah. to me, it's a, it's a personally devastating story because of his injuries and, the, and what led him to get that injury, and then his loss, and then ultimately recovery. You know, that to me is the essence of what is on this page. And I think you know, Jim, to your point, I think that's one of the reasons why this is resonating with Americans, because this is this is the experience that at this time in history, fewer people are serving as a percentage of the population than ever yeah. before. You know? 
You know, it's interesting. Um, uh, Admiral McRaven, who's a very good author uh, on his own, yeah. very, he actually did the first event with us on Monday. And he said something about the book, which is so, um, um, it really resonates right now. He said, if these challenging times caused you to lose hope, this book will reaffirm your faith in all that is good and honorable about this country. Uh, which is it's just fascinating, given, you know, whatever, all the craziness that's going on right now. Uh, and a lot of people are kind of shaking their heads, whether they're on the left or the right. Uh, I think everybody is, sh is shaking their heads. And, and th that's a piece of this. There's, you know, it, obviously a lot of people are having trouble with the government. People, a lot of people have trouble with church right now. Uh, the military is strong, even, and, and, and it'd be a lot stronger if people understood it better. And that's what we're trying to do. Well, I, I think you're doing it. And I, I didn't know that you had uh, Bill McRaven on before. He used to be my boss at JSOC because uh, when I was a squadron commander there, what, what matters to me th at this point is that I do a better job than him in <laughs> facilitating you guys. To you That's great. all that matters here <laughs> now. He so didn't have I, to be I, I'm going to have to laugh. So this is good. <laughs> <laughs> well, so um, Matt, from your standpoint, as a guy who's walked the walk, like a lot of us who spent a lot of time and, 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 and committed a lot of your life, hair follicles and, you know, blood, sweat and tears to, to the type of work that we've done. Uh, from your standpoint, now that it's, it's out there in the wild, how do you feel about it? Do you think it's going to get there and do what you hoped it would? Uh, Dan, I do. And, um, you know, there's no way to answer that question in one sense without being a little self-serving so uh, if you're listening to this, I hope everybody would, would give me a little bit of rope here, but uh, I do. And, and, and there's a couple of reasons why. And, and you, know, you know the community we spent a lot of time in, um, which paradoxically cloaked in secrecy yet seems to be front and center on the news you know, more often than not. And when we started this, I was like, you know, it'd be really easy. And Jim, I remember Jim asked me, he's like, do you think you can get a hundred people to tell you a story? And I'm like, man, of course. I, you know, I yeah. call everybody from, you know, Task Force Ranger. I call everybody up at USASOC, JSOC, and we'll go from there. And, you know, Bob's your uncle. Uh, and then I started thinking, you know, that not only one would that be too easy, but that wouldn't be a fair representation, you know? And so it was like, Let's let's talk a little bit about what the rest of the army and navy and air force and marines are doing. And you know, the more I gained steam to to fill this mission that we had, um, you know, we're introducing America and the world to you know the 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 the, the width and the breadth of of America. You know, the melting pot. You know, the kid from St. Louis, the kid from Seattle, and the kid from Greenwich. And truck driver, loadmaster, and, you know, a pilot. Like all that, like the things of people that would say, Dan, oh, you know them, they're the ones that are like, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't have a story. Why, why do you want to talk to me? And the more you talk to him, you're like, well, because you single-handedly managed every aircraft in theater, you know, on a moment's notice, because you were in charge of, um, you know, repatriating the fallen back to Walt, you know, to Dover in 48 hours. And you did know, that basically single-handedly. You know, but because I want to touch on something that you mentioned, which was uh, our our culture. I I think, and 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 this will be a, a hand this uh, either grenade or softball over to Jim, depending on how he answers the question. But it, it's the fact that special operations, in particular, is driving a lot of popular culture. You see American flags worn on shoulders. You see baseball hats with tear off Velcro flags and the operator beard is de rigueur in a lot of places now. I find that interesting as a guy who comes from 31 years in that community. But James, for you, you know, as a storyteller and, 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 and an observer of human nature and culture, do you see that affecting this? And do you think that's also related to the book that you've just finished here? Uh, well, it relates. I, you know, he, one of the things, and this has come up a lot, and we hadn't really thought about that that much, but it has come up a lot. I think a lot of us would like to see on the news, whatever, just give us the facts, man. Don't tell us what to think, okay? Don't tell us how to think. Give us the information, and we'll we'll kind of figure it out. But that's what we do with this book. We just tell the stories. We don't editorialize. We don't, you know. It, it, I, I, it doesn't matter whether you're right, left, sideways, whatever. You can read this. Here's the truth, man. Just and you figure out what to do with it. Uh, and and that's and I think that's one of the reasons that people respond well to it. 
And, uh, and as I said, the main thing though, is that people would understand what the military is. And there are people running around with hats and whatever. They don't, they don't have a freaking idea what it is, but they're I doing agree. it anyway. I and that's not, that's not ideal either. <laughs> but uh, it's know, actually I, a misrepresentation of, of what the military is. And I, I think there was a word that popped up earlier. I wrote it down because I have terrible short-term memory from all my own TBI. You know, you get blown up a few times or helicopter crashes and whatnot. But one of the things I think that is central to this and the, the book and the message and that encapsulates everything we're talking about when it comes to military service is selflessness. To me, that word is really the heart of everything yeah. else that we do. As Matt was saying, you know, it doesn't matter if you're coordinating the airlift for a theater or the logistics to, to take a shower or you're the, the blackest special ops operator in Yemen tonight, I think we're out of Yemen now, but wherever you are this evening, it doesn't matter. All of it is, a, is, is selfless. And I think that's one of the things that is the, the, the value of, of, of service and this book as a vehicle to help people. But I also think it's one of the things back to your point, Jim, on, on you know how people consume things that's missing in society a lot is the selflessness that is so important to us, the fabric of society. Yeah. Yep, sacrifice, duty, things that, yeah, it's, I mean, less and less. And, and as you said earlier, there aren't, there's much less people who have served than, than there were 20 years ago, 30 yeah. years, and Dana, 20 years ago. Dana, you know this, sorry, Jim, I didn't mean to step hey, over. Yeah. But uh, just to add on that, um, you know, we're 20 years into this fight. Um, more if you add in time in Africa and some other clandestine places, but you know, call it 20 years and uh, it's below the fold. It's page 16. You know, we just killed the number two Al Qaeda guy, you know, like the national right. pastime the other day. Um, you know, we're more interested in Bitcoin, which is not to say that Bitcoin may or may not be important, but I thought when, when we had this idea, when I say we, really Jim, you know, <clears throat> this idea of reintroducing, um, you know, just, the, 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 the soldiers, the sailors, the airmen, the kid next door, the American sons and daughters that are still downrange. You know, like, as you know, they are, they are young men and women that are still out traipsing around in nasty spots, just getting out of bed right now in Kabul. Um, but, you know, they're, they're, they're out there. And uh, we do need to be reminded, just not shame and blame, but be reminded and say, you know what? I, I now I see it when I see that young guy or gal, um, you know, with a prosthetic, or I see that young guy or gal, you know, with a sleeve of tattoos, you know, walking through the airport. Maybe let me pause for a second before I I make a a, 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 a judgment, you know. And again, I don't want to be preachy, but I'm hopeful that that will come out. One of the but amazing things about the book, and I think why people respond so well to it is just how eloquent these people are. And this was another thing in terms of what we chose to put in. Uh, and you'll get these paragraphs that are just, you know, this Jody Prichard, he's an Air Force flight nurse. This is a two paragraphs. He said, I have a full sleeve tattoo dedicated to the patients I've lost over the years. It's a reminder of what I've seen. It's also a reminder for me to remember that it's okay to feel the way I do, which is a really loaded sentence. I wouldn't trade my life for anything in the world. I love wearing the uniform. You mentioned Mike is, is in the audience there. Uh, and, and, and Mike said, I will never have a single regret about my service. I will think about that young Marine screaming at me to cut his hand off so he can go back and fight with his brothers and sisters. I will think of all the brave soldiers who served with me in Iraq my heart will swell with pride and sadness, and it will haunt me that I will never be able to accurately describe their sacrifices to others. Well, Mike, you, 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 are, you are doing that. You are accurately describing their sacrifice to others, as is everybody else in this book. This, this, is, a, this is a wake up call for, for so many people around the country. And, you know, Clinton, who, who uh, is a friend of mine, and um, he said that he could not put this book out of his mind for three days. 
And he's he. Uh, That's impressive. That's really impressive. For a guy with that we, kind you know, of demand. He's been involved with the military forever. And when he was president, he went to more bases than anybody since uh, FDR. And he said, and he wasn't trying to sell books for us. He said every American should read this book, and he meant it. He meant yeah. it. That's how important. And this isn't about book sales or whatever. But this is about. And it's why I sent it to the first lady and the president or whatever. It's like, man, this is this is a tool for you to, to help people understand what the military is for real. I don't I don't actually have access to those kind of people when I send off my I don't either. You just send them a goddamn thing in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm gonna send mine to Matt in the hopes that he'll give me a blurb. I'm you know, I don't quite have the access to the president. But you know, something else that I think is important for people to understand. And I, I think it's something we were touching on here and it was when, when Matt was talking. One of the things I like to point out to people is that this generation in America's longest running war, if you can call it that, but we've been in some state of war, especially in special operations here and there for a long time. But the veterans who are doing things now, the guys that I trained in the late nineties who came of age and were, were full blown operators at the time of 9-11, have more combat experience than any generation of Americans to include the civil war. These guys have wow. more direct combat experience than any generation of Americans. Yeah. And that's yeah. an important thing for Americans to know is that it may be page 16, but you should realize that the people that are doing this who are suffering, and to me, it goes back to, you know, getting, getting this book into people's hands is to let them know, not that all those kind of individuals are in this book, but the, 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 the devastation you deal with that takes decades to resolve, if ever, is the important part of that. And it, just because it's not important to you before page 15 doesn't mean it's not this incredible fact. Um, so anyway, I, I, I always think that's an important thing to, to let Americans know mm -hmm. when they talk mm -hmm. about the military mm -hmm. today. Yeah, Dan, oh, absolutely. And, and, and I will say too, again, being a little patronizing to my, my, my partner here, um, he made it so easy. You know, you, you, the reader, can pick this book up, like my 89-year-old father, anywhere. You just open it up and you can read six or seven pages and not only capture a great story, but you get to know, like you know these people. You know them in six pages. You, you, you might yeah. not know their birthday, right. but you know them. You, you capture their personality. You capture a little bit of the, you know, the color behind them, you know, of their their childhood or whatever. But you know them, like you feel like if I saw this guy, I'd sit down and have a drink with him or her or whatever. And they're all they're all like that, which I think again, you know, listen, short attention span ever has been, you know, six pages you can do, and six pages keeps you going for another six. And and I think that 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 really this isn't reading, you know, a really complicated battle. I mean, there's so, you know, Dano, there, there's so many great military books about military, um, you know, battles in history, but my gosh, they're snoozers. You just want to punch yourself, you know, yeah. when you're, you're reading about fill yeah. in the blank. Well, that's my know, theory about nonfiction, man. You, you got a lot the reason a lot of people don't read it. It's like, it's more than you want to know. And it's put out in a way and they're writing it for like, I don't know, history professors from the 1950s. Right. No, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But but for a lot of people, I just don't, I don't want all that. I don't want a thousand pages on U.S. Grant, although that actually was pretty cool. Uh, the, the Grant, it was, it was a really great book because he's a really good writer. Uh, but I, I think to your point, Jim, though, I, th therein lies the, the challenge of history. Because again, like so many historians who can who can mine those nuggets that have that are either poignant or they are powerful, but they don't have the ability to put them into a compelling narrative or an arc. It's such a travesty because that's where you want people to get that information. As you pointed out earlier, it's don't tell me what to think. Give me some great information so I can form an opinion as you know someone who's intellectually curious. Uh, and, and you know, I I felt that was my challenge with my last book was to tell this arc of this, this group of guys people didn't really know about, but this American hero. And I really wanted it to be compelling. And I, and I hope that it is, uh, you know, I'm actually in conversation with the world's greatest storyteller. So I'm feeling a little insecure <laughs> at the moment, but I, I'm gonna move past that. But you know, that that's the intent for me is I didn't want it to be a history book because so many of the source materials for me 
were dry. They put me to sleep, but I needed them to get at the story. And I go, it goes back to your book. I think what you guys have done here are, are is, is an essential service for the American public to give them the stuff because this is all very factual. You know, it's like Matt's talking about or the, the nurse you're talking about with the sleeves, Jim. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. One of the things we had to get um, releases so the, uh, the lawyer at Little Brown Woman, we gave her about 150 pages to read early on. And after she read it, she said, I have had no, I had no interest in, in the military, zero. She said, I read this 150 pages. She said they were riveting, which I wasn't expecting. And she said, I cried three times during the 150 pages, which is not to say that this is a book full of sad stories. There are some right. sad stories. There's some high moments. Uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of love in this, in this book, love. I mean, and, and, and that's, I have to find the passage. There's one little passage I'll read to you. Maybe if I can find it, uh, well, take, uh, and humor. Can, yeah. If you can find it, you know, to me, I, I do, I talk about this a lot in my engagements with Hollywood as we're, they're making this movie about this last book and this heroic stand of the individual who's really the central character of my book. But you know, how, to me, they're almost all love stories. It, it is the it is it is the partner word to selflessness that we talked about earlier. To me, anyway, this is this is Dano's opinion. Combat is about love because you know to lay yourself down on the altar of brotherhood or sisterhood to save other people. It's the ultimate statement of love, and this is why so many of us and Matt might agree with me or be able to express this better. You know, for me, that's the, 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 the love I have for the guys I've been in combat with 30 plus years ago transcends uh, my family. And my wife and kids who I love, they are different things, but it is, a, it is a profound thing to me that approaches a mother-child love. I, that I doesn't really get talked about. I mean, that is an interesting thing, and it's maybe a, a, a strong piece about understanding what the, I, I did find the little piece and once again, it's just a paragraph. And uh, he says, I think about the way the door gunner acted during the firefight, how we all came together to help Charlie who had been wounded and get him to safety. It's the greatest symbolism of love I've ever seen in my life. This might sound bad since I have children, but the way these men came together it's absolutely true. There is no greater love, and that's what you're talking about, Dan. And that's yeah. what, and that's what, uh, you know. And and it's, I mean, and, and nobody talks about that in terms of maybe because you know, especially with guys, we don't talk about love, right? No, I, I do it a lot now, and maybe it's because I'm a middle-aged sort of a dork now, and I'm no longer a cool action guy. But the bottom line for me is, love has become a lot more important as a word. I use it a lot. And, I, and we, in our story, when we talk about the movie we we're trying to make with our other project, I always call it a love story. You know, the mm -hmm. Hollywood guys are talking about war and, you know, the, what our guy did. Not want to buy gun stuff. But to me, I'm like, you know what, guys, this is a love story for me. It's love between he and his wife and, and daughters that he sacrificed on behalf of and lost. But it's really for the 23 guys that he saved. And Matt, I mean, you know, you and I, have, Matt and I had the good or misfortune, depending on how you look at it, to be in one of the biggest gunfights in the last 50 years together in American history. It was a huge gunfight. There have been big ones. This was kind of, a, in many ways, numerically a one-sided affair. And, you know, for me, it, that, that, was, that whole experience comes down to a lot of love for people that I would give my life for to this day. Matt, I mean, I'll pass that over yeah. to you. No, Dano, it's spot on. I mean, I, I couldn't, I couldn't add anything more to either you or Jim's comments to that. But it's a great segue into the reason why, post-military, you know, and after the transition, that it becomes so challenging. Um, and again, not that everything in this book is all about the transition and how hard it is and how bad it is and uh, woe is me, but it's really hard because you. Let's face it, you, you, you leave the fill in the blank unit um, after spending 15 months during the surge and you go to work at, you know, JP Morgan Chase, you're not going to have, and no offense to anybody at JP Morgan, but you know, you, you, you're probably not going to feel that same love for your office mates and your trunk monkeys as you do for this. I agree. And that's hard. You know, that becomes you know, and, really and hard. maybe that's a lesson that business needs to take too. 
if they could yeah. if they could care more about the people that work there it, it, they would be more motivated and there would be more camaraderie and whatever rather than pitting people against each other which they do seem to do a lot of companies do yeah you, yeah. you know I, the, I mean, what a reason, stupid thing let's pit everybody against everybody else rather than no <laughs> is that really is that the smartest way to run a business i don't know i, I don't think so i'm a fan well, of the manga die i always think they should have a manga die and you know, just go smoke everybody for hours and hours. But that's, you know, me. Anyway, my, just to finish that point, Dano, and I'll shut up. You know, I, I hope, though, that what people, again, readers will get from reading these stories, you know, everybody goes through this whole, you know, this whole journey. And um, some of them have made it, see, you know, seamlessly. Uh, some of them are really, really choppy. Uh, but, like, when you read these ones that, that, that have had a tough time, they bounce out, you know, a lot of them bounce out and you can say, okay, I'm not alone. I can do this. I got it. I, I can find some, some solace in, in these stories too, you know, and I'm not trying to be therapeutic, I, I think, but I think it's there. I think that is one of the powers of a book like this too, is it, it, there are a lot of, there are more than ever mechanisms in place for young veterans who are struggling post deployment experience or direct combat experience to find that salvation that they need, because I think a lot, a lot of people struggle with it. I struggled, I, I didn't used to talk about it. I'm not gonna bog, talk, bog down on it here, but for me, I went through some really, really dark periods, maybe 15 years ago that I struggled with. And I think one of the things I just wanna to touch on and maybe get your guys' comment on is there's a, I have seen, but I would be interested to hear, there's a distinct, uh, line of demarcation between very young veterans who join early, do some years, and then get out, and their struggles versus older, more mature, or more tenured military veterans who still struggle. I'm not trying to diminish the struggle because I did 31 years, man. I still have days where I want to burn the world down, but I think it's harder for younger people to readjust because the integration into the culture, Jim, as you were pointing out, is absolute. I am no longer this kid from wherever. I'm part of my unit, my team, my platoon, define it however you want, but it is who I am. It's not my role. And when they lose that, they, that's well, when they And as you that. said, they're not, they're not mature yet, some of them. Right, that's they're not. Bad, that's a bad thing, to go from uh, where you understand why you're there, you understand what you're supposed to do, you understand your relationship with other people, there's meaning in your life, and but you're not mature. And then all of a sudden, all that is gone, and that's not the best combination. I was already, you know, this goes back, and, and I'm going to pass this over to Matt, because he will be able to touch on this a bit more, and I think it's worth pausing. When we were in, what everyone who's listening knows is Black Hawk Down, but to Matt and I was Operation Gothic Serpent, the average ranger age was 19. I was already 30. I had been in a while. I'm always seen to be the oldest guy wherever I go. You know, maybe I'm decrepit, but it doesn't matter. There was a big difference between the older guys who were the Delta operators and the guys from my unit and most of the rangers. And here's Matt, who was older than most of the rangers around him, but he's dealing with these 18, 19 was the average, right, Matt? Something so like that, 19 to 20. 20. I mean, it was young. Right. That's that's hard to control and it's hard to adapt. And, you know, it's just, it's one of the things why, if you are listening to this and you pick up this book, why you should really pay attention to young of your veterans when you see them and you want to say thank you. I encourage people to take that pause and really look them in the eye and see if you think they're okay. Because the thing you can do as an American citizen to help them, I would say is to listen. Uh, gentlemen, would you agree? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 100%. And, 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 and I throw in, again, just a little color commentary to that too. Um, and you piggyback off of what you said earlier, Dano, about you know, these, these, uh, those that came of age you know, post 9-11, you know, they spend more time in Baghdad and Jalalabad and Kabul and Yemen than they have in, you know, Baltimore and DC. Um, you read these stories, you know, of a really, you know, the other side of that coin, this really mature 24 year old, you know, who had never been on a plane till she went to 
basic training, literally. And all of a sudden, you know, they've seen the other side of the mountain. They've been deployed, you know, four, five, six times. They've done all this stuff and they're not even 25. And they're so well put together. They're articulate. They're funny. And, and they're deep. They say things like, like the Rory Hamill uh, comment. It, it really was, it was so, um, I, I don't want to say invigorating, but, you know, to listen to them. Again, you know, I'm doing this in my 50s and I'm thinking, man, I'm like their great grandfather. And yet it's just like, it brings you right back. You're like, these are, this, it's the coolest thing about the Army and the Navy Air Force Marine. It's a, it is a band of brothers and sisters. I mean, it really is, that's cliche, I apologize, but you get to see that in this book too. And I think that, that's, some, that's a shot in the arm, if, if, if I can so say I just that. I want you to that. know that I see you kind of as a grandfather too, just so you know. I, <laughs> I feel like a grandfather, but with a lot of a spry grandfather. I see you both as kids. <laughs> but you know something though, I think this is another, This year, here's the other side of that. The, the dark side that we've been talking about or the challenging side that is the cost of having served as a, as a veteran. But you know what the upside is? Growth. I think it, it helps young people. You know, Jim, as you were talking about, like they haven't matured yet. It, it accelerates your maturation, hyper accelerates your maturation because you're, you're making life and death decisions for people that matter to you, as we all agreed, more than maybe anybody else in the world. And the upside to that is it creates this pretty resilient and versatile person because when they come out of that, you could do four years and come out and you're ready to go to, you know, Chase, you know, or Morgan Stanley or one of these high pressure places, walk in the door, you're still learning as a new person, but you can walk in and go, yeah, I'm comfortable making this decision. I can do that. Mm -hmm. And it is one of the great values of military service. You know, I, I'd agree with the passage you read, Jim. I, I wouldn't trade my experiences in the military for almost anything. The one thing I would trade it for is to get some friends back that I've lost either to suicide or in combat, but it's made me who I am. The other, whatever I've accomplished in my life is directly attributable to my military service because I think I was potty trained when I was 21. You know, I was not a fast maturing guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, and just leadership skills. I mean, uh, especially like, you, you know, my period is more Vietnam and, and I was right. in graduate school, I was at Vanderbilt and whatever, and I got a high number in it, so I didn't have to go uh, in the lottery. Uh, but good friends of mine went, and I, one friend in particular, he said, you know, he came out and he did fine, did pretty well. And he said, I learned leadership as, as a sergeant in, in NAM. He said, I yeah. learned how to be a leader. Uh, and another, and my, I would both you know, agree. my other best friend, he was the captain in the Marines in Vietnam, he said the same thing. He said, I went over there as a, as a jerk and I came back and I, I just, I learned, I, he said, I learned so much and he was ready uh, to, to take up, uh, you know, and, and, and really rise up in, in, in corporate America. Well, so the, Matt, if you, if you had something to add. I'll, yeah, Dan, I will well, just throw it in, you know, cause uh, you know this too, regardless of where you blossom in the surface, you know, we all start at the beginning, you know, we all start in basic training and it's right. that melting pot of Compton to Greenwich to Dallas to Chicago, <laughs> you know, it's all of that put together. And, you know, you, you realize when you read this story, uh, there's always a little bit of a touch on the beginning. And, and I think that that's really cool to see it because you, again, you get to know these, these soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines and you're like, hey, that really is like the kid down the block or that is like my son or my brother or the kid from high school or the guy I went to graduate school, you know, whatever it is, or the girl that I know at, you know, in the cube next door. Like, I, I just think it, it, it's America. It, you know, it really, it's, it's, sound really smart with microcosm and all that kind of stuff, but you get it, you know, you, you get to see these men and women that, that we all know. And, and they are still at this time, some of the greatest Americans of their generation because they have their willingness to serve through selflessness and the love of making that gesture by coming into service. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left. What I want to do is, maybe uh, touch on a couple other topics while I think people would be interested in, and I, I can see some of where things are coming from. 
uh, you know, Jim, for you, I, I'd be really interested in, and I think other people are, are pretty fascinated by, you know, what, you know, how does the world's foremost storyteller spend his day? What, what's your schedule like? As, you know, you're, you're, I can't walk past a gas station without seeing your damn books. And so, you know, how do you, how do you execute that? What's it look like for you? Somebody said you're lucky if you find something you like to do in life. We talked about this, you know, sense of purpose. <clears throat> and in the military, you, you have a purpose. And, and it's very clear. Uh, but somebody said you're lucky if you find something you love to do, which is true. And then it's a miracle if somebody will pay you to do it. That's my gig. I do not work for a living. I play for a living. I love doing it. I love it. I do it 360 days a year. I, I, I work over, I don't work over the weekends. I play over the weekends. I'm never bored because if I don't know what to do with myself, I go back to the office and write some more. Uh, yeah. It's, you know, and, and, and it's, anyway, my, the way I do it is nuts, but I mean, all the way around me here, there are shelves and there are right now 31 different projects, which range from books to kids' books to uh, I'm doing a couple of podcasts, a uh, couple of movie scripts, you know, whatever. And it's, I remember we had somebody in here from CBS, one of the shows, and uh, I was taking him around and pulling out these drawers of stuff. And he went, this is crazy, this is crazy. And then he said, James, you are crazy. <laughs> so, well, uh, you know. That's my gig. I probably I agree it. with them. I think you're crazy too. Not, no, listen, not, this is my my new profession in life is I want to be an A-list writer, and I'm you know I'm on third book, counting the one the the book that Matt and I did, and you know it is to me it's daunting. So to hear you say that, hopefully for other people that are listening, you know that's part of that encouragement because 31. Look, projects, my first novel was turned down by 31 publishers. Yes. Then so never then won an Edgar for best first mystery. So go figure that one out. Yeah, it's it's a but don't you would you and to pause my here for second book was awful. Value. What's that? My second book was awful, <laughs> god awful, hideous, <laughs> unbelievable. I I when I got you know sort of successful, I went back to try to rescue it. Couldn't even Couldn't imagine how to fix it. Unfixable. It's it's funny. I I, I and I I I you know I I want I hope to follow in your footsteps, which I'll never accomplish. But it's just one of those things that. You know, I, to me, it comes back to the lessons of this military that we're talking about. I apply what I've learned through tenacity in the military to my writing, because I'm like you. I, I, I seven days a week, I'm thinking about stories. I've got another ten novels I want to write, and my agent won't even let me publish them because he keeps giving me these nonfiction homework assignments. But someday I hope to get there, and you, you have to, you know, play that game. But you know, Matt, for you, that you look at Carl Marlantis, right? Matterhorn. Would it take him like thirty years to write that? Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, which is, and then it's a great, I think, at least the writing is great. I don't know how you feel about it, but it's great writing. Well, I mean, but so so for you, I mean, you, you're just constantly dividing yourself around. It sounds to me like an ADD type of guy. That's yeah, I'm so not I'm trying I'm... to call you out. <laughs> yeah, I think that's but right. I am. And I'm proud of it. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so Matt, what about you? Uh, you know, here's, this is your second book where you, you, you know, you're bringing together a bunch of stories, which is the same thing you and I did more writing in the future for you, buddy. Uh, I hope so. Uh, you know, Jim and I have been kicking around some ideas, which, uh, you know, will be fantastic when they, when they, when they start to go. Um, but I would throw this out to you um, and not to be preachy, but, really sharing the experience of the last couple of years for me. Um, say yes to a lot of stuff. You know, if you'd have told me, and we joked about it, Dano, before uh, the, 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 the doggone show started, we said, you know, uh, almost 30 years ago, you know, when yeah. we're sitting there in a gunfight on Holiday Road in Mogadishu, would you ever think that two chuckleheads like us are, or, or in the company of the master storyteller. And you'd say like, absolutely not, you're an idiot. Um, but yet here we are. And, and I mean this, in, you know, to be serious for one second. And it's like, you know, because I said yes to stuff that I would ordinarily have never said yes to that led to the next thing, to the next thing, whether it was starting my own business, um, you know, or going to do a documentary. I don't know anything about documentaries and yet we did it and we won an Emmy for it, which was, you know, crazy. And then you know, through that, it was introduced by happenstance, you know, through a mutual friend to Jim. Um, and so here I find myself in this point in life, 
working with Jim doing this, I think very, very important stuff that in one sense, it's so improbable, but the other side of it is it's absolutely like, a, it seemed like the most normal thing that happened in my life by, by saying yes and saying like, yeah, I, I, I want to do something creative. I'm not the most creative guy, but I'd like to do something. So I'm going to say yes. And um, I think there's a little bit of comfort level. I was like, hey, if he doesn't like it, he being whomever, that, you know, we'll part as friends and that's that. But uh, I, I kind of just take the opportunity to throw out a little bit of advice to, to anybody that's listening. Uh, don't be afraid to say yes. Don't, don't, don't take yourself out. Somebody else offered, makes an offer and say yes. Why not? You got nothing to lose. Well, that's so it's the courage to fail. And it's funny because, you know, Absolutely. your host last time was Bill McRaven. And, and when he was my, my boss at JSOC, you know, it was one of his, he threw it out all the time, fail, fail often, don't make the same mistake, but it, it, you have to go out, especially when you're trying to do these things. One question for you, Matt, that came from the audience um, that I want to pitch to you while we still got about 10 minutes was, you know, th did you experience when you were doing these the interviews with people, did you feel that, that it was a healing process for some or many of these veterans to relay that story to you. And then, you know, again, for you and Jim to then put it on the page. Uh, I, I, would, I would nod my head I, and I couldn't see it empirically that, oh my gosh, everybody came to the great Eversman and, you know, off they went. I think but I can tell you this, I, I can, it's like the great kazoo. I can tell you this, Dano, you know, I would, I would have these interviews um, sometimes you would be in tears. Sometimes you would be in tears from laughing. Sometimes you just sort of mellow. Well, you know, you had to go through all the emotions. But I would always, you know, finish up usually in the evening. Next day, because listen, everybody's done talking to everyone. Next day, I'd, I'd send them an email. Say, hey, you know, I'll try to send them a new note. And say, hey, thanks. I, I, I can't tell you how many notes I would get that night, or I'd wake up to an email thanking me for just listening. You know, just yeah. listening. And, and I can tell you in the last, um, you know, this week, I have gotten emails from, you know, these several of the folks that are, are, are profiled this saying, thank you. I, I never thought, you know, this would happen. I never thought you'd see my story. I never thought that anybody would care. And, you know, on one hand, you're like, you're not the island of misfit toys, man. You're, you, you know, you're You've, you've done a great service and we're sharing it with you. So I, I hope it has been. I mean, I hope it has been. And listen, you know, the guy to thank is, 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 is sitting right here with us. It's Jim Patterson. He's, he's the one that was able to convey everything we've talked about tonight. You know, feeling, emotion, story, the narrative, the backdrop, whatever it is, and do it in eight pages. I mean, I'm telling you, a lot of people, most, most people can't do that. And the, I think the power of that is the fact, and this goes back to your message, but to the people who are listening and then those veterans who participated with this book was the courage to step out onto that limb. And, you know, Jim, to come over to you, I think what's great about your being part of this process is as a guy who sells more books than anybody to take this on, by virtue of your name, it was guaranteed it was going to get the traction it needed at a publisher somewhere. And I can't remember. Point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I, but this goes back to Matt's thing about saying yes. Um, right. Um, I, I had to say yes to nonfiction. And actually the first time it actually was, the, the, uh, 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 Matt mentioned uh, Malloy and Malloy, another bar story. Uh, we had done a, a documentary <laughs> which, which uh, about a couple of towns that were messes. And we wanted to do another one. He started telling me about this guy, Jeffrey Epstein. And I went, I don't want to do a documentary. I want to do a book. And, mm -hmm. and that was the first nonfiction right. I ever did, The Filthy Rich. Uh, um, but I hadn't done it before. And, and my, my, you know, my, my gift or whatever the hell it is, is, is imagination. And with nonfiction, you kind of can't do that. You're not supposed to make stuff up. Um, <laughs> But that was, and once again, it's can I do that? I don't know if I can do nonfiction. And then with this, with this book, uh, it's like, okay, we're going to have all these interviews, and I don't think that's enough. You know, I don't think, I don't think that's, I think that's going to get boring after a while to read these interviews. Because for one thing, you had Matt in there way too much because he was yeah. asking all the questions. This guy talks all the time. <laughs> Yeah, he's a pro Matt's always been a problem in my life, anyway. That I was our the biggest struggle writing this thing was to get Matt out of the narrative. 
Uh, you know, you got to drag a weak link around. Every you both have had the you both can say you both had the occasion to drag Matt Eversman around the anchor of anchors. You know, dead uh, weight well, all the time. We're not going to let you get away with that. I I think so. You know, we're we're into the last uh, five minutes of our of our time. Uh, you know, I would just like to express to you as an American and a veteran my appreciation for the the two of you taking this on and doing this. You know. It's. I, I think it's part of what is important for Americans to understand. Anyway, uh, closing thoughts. I mean, I, Matt, let me pass it over to you for some from closing thoughts for you. Anything that you'd share with with the audience of people who've who've taken the time to listen to you tonight? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you. If you if you stayed up on a school night to 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 listen, uh, I really do sincerely appreciate it. Um, and I hope that you'll you'll read this book. And I hope. You'll, you'll, you'll think about, if nothing else, just, we've got, you know, all is not lost. Everything's not bad. There's some good things to, to get fired up about. And, and again, you, you'll have to read it. It's not all about war, although war is a big part of it. But, you know, it, it's, it's, like you said, Dan, oh, I mean, it's a love story. And these are people you can fall in love with. You really can. You're like, I can, right. you know, respect them, love them and be fired up that, that we've got these kinds of men and women still out doing it for us. So that's my thought. I appreciate your, your um, willingness to host this today too, Dan. Uh, yeah, this is great, man. Dan. Uh, it's been, listen, it's, it's really good. It's it wasn't seamless, pleasure. but it was great. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a little, it, a little clunky. On. I need some help. Like you, you cannot ever talk to you know Admiral McRaven and tell him he did a better job than me. He's a SEAL. He already thinks he's better at anything that I'm going to do anyway because I'm just an Air Force guy. But uh, but Jim, can I you know can we come over to you and get some of your thoughts? Anything that you'd like to share with the folks who who've joined us this evening? Uh, you know for for this book in particular. No, I mean, I, and Matt gets brought up this notion, obviously, and it, it's, it's not a money thing, but we just hope people will read, the, read this book because it's, it's just so important for people to understand. And, you know, we're in a period right now where there's so much negativity. Uh, and this is a very positive book. It's a very positive mm -hmm. book. This right. is a hopeful, um, um, because, because, because the military is so important in our society and, and misunderstood by too many people. Yeah, I, and I, th I do. I do think it's misunderstood. Well, with with that, I and see Kimberly is on the screen, which is probably my escape hatch, and I should dive into that portal while I can before I say something foolish because I probably already have. But gentlemen, listen, it's been such a, a pleasure. You know, Matt, you're you're one of my favorite Rangers of all time, and uh, you know, Jim, it's just been an absolute pleasure to to get to know you this evening. I hope we all. Get a chance to cross paths, Kimberly. Dan, yeah, you did a great you. job. This is not an easy job. Not an easy job to be the moderator. Well, thanks. Y'all, y'all really did a selfless job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank the three of y'all and thank all of you who are listening live now or watching this later. Uh, I will be emailing all ticket holders a copy of this video so you can share it with your family. If you want extra copies of the book, you can get them from the Country Bookshop. I will include links for that. And I will also include links for Dan's book, Alone at Dawn, and his upcoming book uh, that I mentioned in my introduction that I think is another required reading for everyone about how to use what these gentlemen have learned in the military and apply it to your life as you're going through your day, situational awareness and being safe. But thank you again. Thank you all for attending and taking the time to support the country bookshop in our military with, with getting this knowledge everywhere in serving. Awesome. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank Dan, you. Oh, good thank luck, you. man. We'll talk soon. Yeah, Thanks, we'll man. have to do that. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for listening. And, and Jim and Matt, we'll, we'll hopefully we'll, I'd like to cross paths with you guys. It'd be great. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, Jimbo, we'll see you.